Gasoline prices hit a record high. Team Bush insists drilling here and building more nuclear plants will bring energy prices down. The death of Dale Earnhardt. New developments on the seatbelt mystery. Was it broken or not? Eye on America. HMOs allegedly putting profits ahead of patients. Wait till you hear his horror story. Also, NASA and the Russians turned the super expensive new space station into a room for a sideshow. This is the CBS Evening News with Dan Rather reporting from CBS News headquarters in New York. Good evening. The Bush administration today outlined its plan for dealing with the worsening shortages and growing prices of energy. Today, gasoline on the commodities markets went up 50 cents to close at $1.13 a gallon. That is the wholesale price. An Energy Department survey today finds the price at the pump is up another penny in the past week to a nationwide average now of $1.63 a gallon. In the past five weeks, the price has risen a big 23 cents. It's the law of supply and demand. Not enough refineries turning out enough to meet this country's thirst for gasoline. CBS's Cynthia Bowers reports. This refinery fire near St. Louis over the weekend didn't look like much, but it's having a dramatic impact, especially after this spectacular blaze at another refinery in California last week. Fear the fires will lead to shortages sent gas prices skyrocketing. It already has had an explosive impact on prices. Uh, prices for gasoline in some of the upper Midwest markets have gone up anywhere from 10 to 15 cents. The refining capacity lost as a result of these two fires accounts for only a tiny fraction of the millions of barrels refined each day in this country. But with reserves at a seven-year low and demand continuing to rise, it is only fueling speculation there won't be enough gas for the summer. And as a result, traders sent gas futures to an all-time high today, making consumers more suspicious than ever. I think it's a big game. A lot of people want to make some money off this sort of thing. And it may seem so when you consider refiners are now making as much as $24 on the barrel, far surpassing profits from last year, and again spurring a chorus of complaints from consumers and Congress. We can legitimately ask the people who are creating the gasoline for us whether they're doing everything they can to keep prices reasonable for consumers and businesses across America. Like figuring out how better to get different fuel formulas to market as required by federal clean air standards or keep supplies flowing despite aging and inadequate pipelines and refineries. And with the worries about some of the refineries this summer uh, with the power snugness and the potential power outages, uh, you've got a worried, worried market right now. And in a market where prices are being driven by what one analyst calls petronoia, here's a startling irony. Traders say rather than crude oil pushing up U.S. gas prices, it is now our gas prices pulling up the cost of crude. Cynthia Bowers, CBS News, Chicago. So what is the White House planning to do about the low supplies and high prices of gasoline and other energy? A task force headed by the vice president has been working on that behind closed doors. Today, as CBS's John Roberts reports, Dick Cheney, who helped design the policy, let the nation in on a policy that puts President Bush on a collision course with environmentalists. With America bracing for another summer of pain at the pump, the White House today issued more dire warnings about the potential impact on the economy and stressed the urgent need to get more oil from the tanker into the tank. As a country, we've demanded more and more energy, but we've not brought online the supplies needed to meet that demand. In a sweeping new energy policy to be released next month, Vice President Cheney will offer federal help to oil and gas companies to dramatically increase their refining capacity and build thousands of miles of pipeline to get natural gas to market. And he will press to develop new resources off the Gulf Coast and in Alaska's National Wildlife Refuge. Putting a major industrial facility in the heart of the nation's most pristine wildlife refuge just doesn't make any sense. Environmental groups have lined up to oppose drilling in Alaska. The president's own brother is against drilling off the coast of Florida. 
but Democrats from oil producing states say everyone has to pull their weight. When you have all of the east coast of the United States shut off, all of the west coast shut off, a large portion of the Nanwar in Alaska closed. Uh, you can't say uh, not in my backyard and expect to have enough resources. Warning that California's rolling blackouts threaten to roll nationwide, Cheney will also move to streamline the approval process for hundreds of new power plants. He will promote the use of abundant coal over cleaner burning oil, even seek construction of the first new nuclear plants in 20 years. America's energy challenges are serious, but they are not perplexing. We know what needs to be done. While the vice president today encouraged the development of renewable resources, he dismissed alternative fuels as years away. And he stressed efficiency over austerity, saying that while conservation may be a sign of personal virtue, it is not the basis for a sound energy policy. Dan? John Roberts at the White House. On the stock markets, blue chip stocks extended their rally in the early going today, then fell back on profit taking. The Dow closed down 75 points, putting it back in negative territory for the year. The Nasdaq went the other way today, up 40 points. Four weeks after a U.S. Navy reconnaissance plane collided with a Chinese fighter jet, the U.S. Navy today began taking concrete steps to retrieve the crippled American aircraft from an island in the South China Sea. It includes paying the Chinese some money. CBS News national security correspondent David Martin has more on the plane and the puzzle of how to get it home. The Navy plane still sits in the same place, that line of trucks apparently a barricade to prevent it from somehow flying away. But help is on the way. A team of U.S. defense contractors from Lockheed Martin, which made the plane, is en route to Hainan Island to see exactly what kind of shape it's in. The Chinese have told Ambassador Joseph Pruer, who ends his tour of duty today, they want the plane out by the end of May. We're pleased that we were able to get uh, an initial step to get the, uh, the first start to get getting the airplane back. The Chinese had balked at allowing the American military onto their air base, so the five-member team is made up of civilians. They will determine if the plane can be repaired enough to fly again or if the structural damage is so great it will have to be taken apart and shipped home. And then there is the question of who will pay. U.S. officials say they will foot the bill for any Chinese equipment or labor they use. But they also maintain the cost of repairing the aircraft should be subtracted from the bill. The Chinese are still going out of their way to complain about the incident. Over the weekend, a photo of the Chinese pilot lost in the collision suddenly appeared on a U.S. government website. It apparently was the opening salvo in a campaign of hack attacks promised for this week, which has forced the Pentagon to place its computer networks on a higher state of alert. But the real crunch will come when the U.S. resumes surveillance operations. Pentagon officials plan to phase them in gradually, beginning with an oceanographic research ship which once was chased off by the Chinese Navy and with flights along the east coast of China. The Chinese pilots have not been so aggressive as the pilots who intercepted American planes near Hainan. David Martin, CBS News, the Pentagon. The State Department reported today that 405 people died in terror attacks worldwide last year. That's a 75 percent jump from 1999. 19 were Americans, including 17 sailors aboard the USS Cole. The report cites Iran as the most active sponsor of terrorism and Afghanistan as the prime training ground for terrorists from around the world. Serious questions about the death of stock car racing champion Dale Earnhardt in this year's Daytona 500 have drawn little but denials from NASCAR officials. But as CBS's Bobby Harley reports tonight, the questions persist and they were bolstered again today by one of the first track workers to peer inside Earnhardt's battered race car. In the seconds after racing legend Dale Earnhardt crashed, emergency medical technician Tommy Probst and his two partners were the first people to reach him. He raised his head up and we, we seen then that, you know, it wasn't good. NASCAR claims a broken seatbelt caused the death of its biggest star, but Probst says that's not what he saw. The belt was not broken when I took it off of him and when I laid, took it off his leg, the belt was not broken. Yet Probe says NASCAR's never questioned him, even though just days after the February 18th accident, the racing organization announced it was the emergency technicians who reported the broken belt. What the people that came to the scene to, to, to uh, Dale Earnhardt's aid found, it was separated right in this area. 
Today, NASCAR refuted Probst's claims, saying it was a female emergency technician working on Earnhardt. That woman is Probst's partner, Patty Dobler. Before the cameras were rolling, she told CBS News she did not believe the seatbelt had broken. But later, when accompanied by the spokesman of Daytona International Speedway, which is controlled by the chairman of NASCAR, she wasn't so clear. It had a lot of play to it, but it did not come out of my hand. Earlier this month, an independent medical expert found the seatbelt, broken or not, had no role in Earnhardt's death. As for Probst, ironically a former grammar school classmate of Earnhardt's, his months of silence have taken a toll. It got to the point where I couldn't sleep at nights and stuff like that, and it started bothering me and bothered me. NASCAR still has the seat belts, but has never allowed any outside investigators to view them. And while it says it's conducting its own investigation, it's never revealed its experts or will even say whether the results will be made public. Bobby Harley, CBS News, Miami. 136 years after novelist Jules Verne sent some fictional sightseers from Earth to the moon, the first real space tourist is settling in tonight aboard the International Space Station. And as CBS's Elizabeth Palmer reports, at a cost of two and a half million dollars a day, it really is an out of this world trip. Two whole days hurtling through space aboard the cramped Soyuz capsule hadn't rubbed the shine off Dennis Tito. He glided through the hatch of the International Space Station wearing a Russian cosmonaut's uniform and a delighted grin. Well, it was uh, a great trip here, and uh, I don't know about this adaptation that they talk about. I'm already adapted, so uh, I love space. Tito is still a novice at weightlessness. But a hand from a more experienced colleague guided him to a safe perch. He'll spend most of his time here in the Russian portion of the space station, where today he and the cosmonauts received an all-day safety briefing from the resident crew. From the moment Tito blasted off on Saturday to today's flawless docking, everything has gone smoothly. But Dennis Tito almost didn't get this far. Even months of intensive training weren't enough to convince NASA officials that Tito was ready. There was no room for a mere sightseer on board the space station, they grumbled. But the Russians insisted he would fly, mostly because they needed the $20 million he said to have paid for his ticket. Dennis Tito is due back on Earth next Saturday, but already the Russian space agency, as travel agency, seems to have another client. The director of the blockbuster movie Titanic, James Cameron, says he'd like to cut a deal to become the next tourist in orbit. Elizabeth Palmer, CBS News, Moscow. Next on the CBS Evening News, if you're covered by managed care, you'll want to see tonight's Eye on America investigation. Tonight's Eye on America begins a special investigative series, a hard news look at big health insurance companies. Almost two-thirds of all American workers and their families now get their health insurance through what are called managed care plans, such as HMOs. At last count, that's 160 million Americans. There are accusations that some managed care plans are mismanaging patient coverage. CBS's Cheryl Atkinson has been looking into this. Both of them. Anthony Capasso thought he'd done everything right before having painful surgery to replace both knees. He notified his insurance company, Blue Cross Blue Shield, and even got their pre-approval for four days in the hospital and eight days at a rehabilitation center. But literally on his way to rehab, Blue Cross suddenly reneged on their agreement to pay for it. I was shocked. And my doctor, Lynch, he was, he was upset. He went crazy. They said yelling and screaming. and. But they said, we're the boss, we'll do what we want. So Capasso, who's legally blind, went home instead, where he fell, just trying to get up the stairs. And then I just went to grab him and I missed and I went down and... I mean, he was the last person you should ever think about sending somebody directly home with having just had their knees replaced. Dr. Kevin Lynch was Capasso's surgeon. Mr. Capasso said you were irate. I was beyond irate. He had nobody to help him. He's blind. Dr. Lynch is so fed up, he's now joined 7,000 other doctors in one of the broadest legal challenges to the health insurance industry. And it's happening in Connecticut, of all places, the insurance capital of the world. 
The lawsuit claims health insurance giant Cigna, Oxford, Connecticut, Aetna, Physician Health Services, and Anthem Blue Cross Blue Shield are harming patients by denying crucial medical care, illegally denying and delaying claims, and using unfair and deceptive trade practices. These are stock-held companies, so their priorities are entirely different than mine. You know, they want healthy stock. I want healthy patients. And it's not just doctors in Connecticut, but also Texas, California, and Georgia who've launched legal assaults. All seek a massive change in the way health care is managed. We are in an increasingly dysfunctional health care system that is dangerously out of balance, and we must alter the face of medicine, and we feel this is our best chance to do that. The whole concept behind managed care was that insurance companies would deal with the billing hassles and doctors could spend all their time with patients. But critics say managed care created a monster, insurers that too often dictate cheaper, lower quality care. The insurance companies being sued won't talk about specific cases because of patient confidentiality. But they say the system for the most part works. Any mistakes are honest ones, and the only thing the legal battle will do is cost doctors and patients money. Keith Stover lobbies for the insurance industry. Let's just be honest. It is never in the interest of an insurance company to have a patient get sicker. It's catchy rhetoric. But the fact is, it is not in our interest. But patients like Anthony Capasso say they're proof the system isn't working. I don't think it's one bit fair. Two years after his knees were replaced, Capasso is back on his feet. But there's no way to know how his long-term recovery will be affected because he didn't get the therapy his doctors said he desperately needed. In Hartford, Connecticut, I'm Cheryl Atkinson for Eye on America. Tomorrow, CBS's investigation digs into allegations that big health insurance companies systematically delay or deny legitimate medical claims and stick you for the bill. We have an update tonight on a recent Eye on America report about a divorced father in Texas. He learned through DNA testing that he fathered only one of the four children born during his marriage. An appeals court today upheld a ruling that Morgan Wise must continue paying child support for all four children. Up next on CBS, Every the latest on the Kerry controversy. Two very different versions of a wartime nightmare. A U.S.-based aid group estimated today that three million people have died in Congo's nearly three-year-old civil war, most of them civilians who died of starvation or disease. The International Rescue Committee says it surveyed only the rebel-held eastern half of Congo, scene of the worst fighting, so the real toll may be even greater. It was 26 years ago today that another war, the war in Vietnam, came to an end. 60 Minutes 2 and the New York Times Magazine have been jointly investigating a troubling story from that war, an attack led by future Senator Bob Kerry that killed more than 20 Vietnamese civilians, most of them women and children. The facts remain in dispute. CBS's Jim Axelrod has the latest. The battle over what happened in this Vietnamese village 32 years ago moved to this New York City apartment this past weekend. Here, Bob Carey and five of his squad members met and then issued this statement about their mission that left more than 20 unarmed civilians dead, mostly women and children. At the village, we received fire and we returned fire. Since the middle of last week when the story broke, Kerry had maintained his squad was returning enemy fire. But until now, his men had mostly been silent. And I have every reason to believe that there were soldiers in that area. Uh, and every reason to believe the fire we took came from them. And every reason to believe that our lives were in danger. The one exception has been Gerhard Klan who sharply disputed Kerry's account in his interview with Dan Rather for 60 Minutes 2. Did you take fire coming in? No. Gunfire of any kind? No. Anything that even remotely sounded like gunfire? No, not that I recall. No. Tonight, a 32-year-old story is showcasing the power the Vietnam War still holds on the United States and all the ambiguity and confusion that remains unresolved. We probably won't ever get to a satisfactory definition of what happened. But we should try. The truth is always worth pursuing. We owe it to the people who were killed that night. Tonight, at least one part of the story appears clear. 
Bob Carey won a bronze star for the mission on that night 32 years ago. Today, Carey's aide told us, quote, at this point, he has no intention of giving it back. Dan? Jim Axelrod, thanks. The full story, contradictory glimpses into what some of the Vietnam War was really like from Bob Carey and Gerhardt Klan will be broadcast on 60 Minutes 2 tomorrow night at 9, 8 Central Time. You thought you had health insurance, so why isn't your doctor being paid, and why are you getting the bills? You believe they are systematically, intentionally denying legitimate claims? Yes. Yes, we do believe that. Mismanaged Care, an Eye on America special investigation continues tomorrow on the CBS Evening News with Dan Rather. It's a blast from the space age past. NASA says it has reestablished contact with Pioneer 10, the little space engine that could. Launched in March 1972, it became the first spacecraft to beam back close-ups of Jupiter and in 1983, the first to leave our solar system. It's now more than seven billion miles from Earth and is heading for the stars. Pioneer 10 carries a gold plaque, including a map to Earth, just in case anyone out there wants to look us up. And that's part of This and Other Worlds tonight. We hope you'll make the CBS Evening News part of your day tomorrow. Dan Rather reporting. Good night. For news 24 hours a day, CBS.com on the Internet and on our interactive partner, America Online, at keyword CBS News. This is CBS.